Hello class. Welcome to Network Technology 224, Connecting Networks. I'm Professor Dwight Hughes. We're looking at Chapter 4 today, Frame Relay. We're going to introduce the concept of Frame Relay. We'll take a look at how to configure Frame Relay, and then we'll go over some steps to troubleshoot connectivity in a Frame Relay network. At the end of this lecture, you should be able to describe the fundamental concepts of frame relay technology. You should be able to configure a basic frame relay permanent virtual circuit. You should be able to describe advanced concepts of the frame relay technology, and you should be able to configure an advanced frame relay permanent virtual circuit. Introduction to frame relay. Frame relay is a packet switching technology. It was developed to be a more cost-effective solution to a leased line. With a T1, that would be a leased line, you must purchase the full bandwidth all the way across the network. And when you're not using part of that bandwidth, you're still paying for it. With Frame Relay, it allows you to use a single circuit to access multiple destinations through the Frame Relay packet switching network. And when you're not using the bandwidth within the Frame Relay packet switching network, it can be used by others. So for instance, you might purchase different bandwidths to different destinations. Here's an example where Toronto has purchased 16 kilobits per second up to Chicago headquarters and 48 kilobits per second down. You can see a similar scenario for Mexico City and Dallas. But then Dallas has a second circuit that connects directly to New York. This is all carried on one physical cable into the Frame Relay network. This is how you'd have to do it with dedicated lines. So Frame Relay provides a more cost-effective and flexible way to interconnect multiple locations within your enterprise WAN. There's two types of virtual circuits within the Frame Relay network. You can have a switched virtual circuit that we won't be building in this class and a permanent virtual circuit. A switched virtual circuit is created at the time of, of need. So it's much like dial up on a telephone where you dial the number at the time you wish to place the call and at that very moment the destination of that circuit is determined. With a permanent virtual circuit it is pre-configured ahead of time, generally when you sign up for the account. Virtual circuits are identified by their DELCs. Frame Relay DELCs have only a local significance and they identify the logical circuit that your endpoint wants to access. You can have multiple virtual circuits defined. Here's an example where in the red and black links you can see the physical circuits and the green and orange links are showing the logical PVCs, permanent virtual circuits that are built. So logical uh, circuit del C319 connects the top and bottom left routers. And then logical circuit del C102 connects the bottom two routers. So the bottom left router has two virtual circuits. So depending which number it puts in the frame relay frame will determine where the destination point is going to be. Here's a look at that frame encapsulation. We have an address field in the frame relay header, and it has the place to put the source and destination Del C information. Several frame relay topologies can be created from point to point to multi point to a full or partial mesh. We can see on the right side a full mesh topology for frame relay. Notice each site still only has one physical connection, saving money. So each site would purchase something like a T1 or a um, fractional T1 to the frame relay cloud. Then within the cloud, it will be packet switched um, to one or multiple destinations. Here's how you map it. So we can map a destination. Notice the map command here is telling the router the IP address of a destination 
associated with the DELSI. In this case, DELSI 102 is the frame relay DELSI number to use in the frame if you wanted to reach the um, destination 10.1.1.2. So if you had a router on the other side of the frame relay network that you needed to route packets to, you would use a frame 102. Show frame relay LMI will provide information for you on the uh, frame relay circuit, whether it's up, um, what type of circuit, it's either ANSI or Cisco. And LMI is basically a local management uh, messaging system between your router and the frame relay network. So the frame relay network is able to communicate to your router. And we can see here some timers on when those communications have happened. LMI extensions. Okay. LMI can handle uh, virtual circuit status messages, multicasting, global addressing, and simple flow control. LMI can use inverse ARP to map addresses. So what happens is LMI can tell you that all the DELCs that your circuit has been pre-configured for and then your router can send an ARP request to each of those and request the IP address associated with those DELCs. In this way, Frame Relay can automatically configure itself for remote destinations. We have the concept of a committed information rate, which is the minimum amount of bandwidth that you are guaranteed. So this is the guaranteed bandwidth. We have something else called the burst rate, the BR, and that's the maximum bandwidth that you can attain. So that's the up to bandwidth, and the CIR is the minimum bandwidth. You would never get less than the CIR. So here's a, an example of CIRs. So when all these circuits were running a CIR of 48 kilobits per second, on a link that's 64 kilobits per second. So that means we could get up to 64 kilobits per second on this link, because we have a link capable of 64 kilobits, but we're only paying for 48. So that's all that's being guaranteed. That's what we're paying for a guarantee. And sometimes that, um, that CIR is, uh, in the case on the right, you can see um, DELC 102 is being guaranteed only 32 kilobits and DELC 103 only 16 for a total of 48. Remember, the different DELCs are logical circuits. They share the same physical path. So we have to make sure that our logical circuits don't exceed the physical path bandwidth, in this case, 64 kilobits. Bursting. So burst is the ability to go above your CIR as shown in the graph here. The CIR is 32 kilobits and the green line indicates that packet volume has exceeded that and is in what's called the committed burst area. Then it would enter the BE, which is the eligible burst area. So that's just the ability to burst up. So the BC, uh, that means that that's a burst above the 32 kilobit um, guarantee for this DELSI, but it's still within the overall 48 kilobit um, aggregate committed information rate for the link. So remember, we have a 64 kilobit link and we are guaranteed 48 kilobits. So we will always get the BC as long as the other DELSI is not using it. So if this was the only DELSI on this router sending, it would be able to burst up to 48 kilobits without issue. And if available on the frame relay network, you could even burst all the way to 64, but that is not guaranteed. So that's the BE or burst eligible is the not guaranteed part of the bandwidth allocation. So in this way, you only need to purchase the bandwidth you absolutely need. And many times you will get much more bandwidth than that on a availability basis. Frame Relay has the ability to do beckon and fecken. And these are flow control notices sent through LMI. So we can tell your router whether there is upstream or downstream congestion. If your router is informed that the Frame Relay network is congested, it can start marking frames as discard eligible, abbreviated as DE. 
So a discard eligible frame can be thrown away if there is not enough bandwidth to send it. This is only a case if you are getting into that BE territory where you are sending more traffic than you've been guaranteed on the network. The network will arbitrarily just throw away frames that are above your guaranteed bandwidth. To make sure that the frames that are thrown away are the ones you want to have thrown away, your router can set a discard eligibility bit on those frames. Let's talk about configuring frame relay. Some basic frame relay configuration steps. We have to turn on the encapsulation on the interface and then choose whether we want to dynamically learn the mappings of the remote destination or statically address those. This is how you would create a static route for frame relay. So you would use the frame relay map command. And if you type show frame relay map, you can see those mappings. Notice they simply consist of the exit interface, the next hop IP, and the DELSI number. Essentially, it's connecting the layer 2 DELSI number with the layer 1 port with the layer 3 address. So it's doing a nice thing for the router of providing the layer 3, 2, and 1 um, information it needs to send data. Reachability issues. Frame Relay is a non-broadcast multiple access network, so by default, Frame Relay does not forward broadcasts. Frame Relay predates multicast, so Frame Relay um, treats multicast the same as a broadcast, so by default, multicast traffic is also not permitted on a Frame Relay link. For this reason, you can have some reachability issues. For instance, routing tables typically use broadcasts or multicast to be populated by the routing protocol like RIP, EIGRP, OSPF. So you would have to either modify Frame Relay to allow broadcasts or modify your routing protocol to use unicasts to make it compatible with the Frame Relay network. Another reachability issue that you could encounter is Split Horizon. And Split Horizon is a routing protocol rule that when information is learned on one link, it cannot be shared back out the same link. Well, as we saw, Frame Relay uses multiple logical circuits traveling over the same physical link. So a routing protocol could interpret that one physical link when it receives on one logical circuit routing information, it may not send it back out that same link to the other routers that are on separate um, logical circuits. So we have some uh, ways we can deal with that. Um, mainly, we either disable split horizon rule, which is a bad idea, or we use sub-interfaces so that each circuit is sitting in its own logical container. There can also be neighbor discovery issues, because neighbor discovery, again, with routing protocols, they use broadcasts and multicasts. So we might have to statically define the neighbors on a frame relay circuit. As mentioned earlier, we could disable split horizon in the routing protocol. This would be a bad idea because it would likely result in loops. We could use a fully mesh topology, but this increases costs. The best method is to use sub interfaces. We've used sub interfaces before. You're going to just type the interface with a dot and then the sub-interface number, such as interface serial 001.100 would create a sub-interface. You do have to provide whether it's a multi-point or point-to-point -point interface. For the purposes of this class, we will only be creating point-to-point -point interfaces. Then, once you are in the sub-interface, you need to assign it a DELSI number. That's going to connect the layer 2 circuit ID to the physical layer interface. So frame relay interface DELSI and then whatever DELSI circuit number has been assigned to your router for this interface. It would look something like this. 
Notice all three layers of information, the physical layer with the physical interface, the layer three IP address, and the layer two DELSI number, all configured on that subinterface. Let's go over some troubleshooting of connectivity. We can use the show interfaces command to verify that LMI is working correctly. Here I can see that LMI is working. It is LMI type Cisco and it is a DTE. That's data terminal equipment. That means that's the router in. The DCE, remember, would be the frame relay device, which typically be at the um, provider. If I type show frame relay LMI, I may want to verify that I am sending and receiving these LMI messages to and from the frame relay network. The numbers will never be identical and they may be off by a couple. So you might have a, in this case, 578 to 579 is, is very uh, ideal. It might be something like 602 to 578. That's still pretty good. If they're off by a couple, that's fine. That just means a couple messages uh, were missed. But in general, you want to see the numbers fairly close together. If there's a large span, or especially if one is a zero and the other one is in the hundred, something is wrong. We can look at each permanent virtual circuit. So this is looking at del 102. If the circuit says active, that means this circuit should be functioning. At layer two, this is a good circuit. It's up, up. We can look at the manual mapping for this circuit. And if the mapping was created dynamically, we could type clear frame relay inverse ARP, INARP, to clear out the automatic mapping so that it remaps. Occasionally, it may map to the wrong DELSI. And then if we later change the DELSI, say the frame relay per switch, um, changes the DELSI, it doesn't get remapped unless we clear the mapping. You can see that in this example here where we are clearing the mappings so that they are regenerated correctly. So this is one troubleshooting technique is to clear your frame relay inverse art mappings so they remap if you are having connectivity issues. A last resort would be to debug the LMI frame to verify the interface it's coming in and out of and the DELSI numbers that are being received and sent. In summary, we've covered the fundamental concepts of frame relay technology. We've looked at how to configure basic frame relay for a permanent virtual circuit. We've looked at the advanced concepts of frame relay and we've looked at permanent virtual circuits. Thank you and see you in class.